There we go. Um, so good afternoon, everyone. Good morning, depending upon where you might find yourselves. Um, we're kicking off a panel uh, this morning, or I am, I should say we collectively, High Crimes, Low Crimes, and Misdemeanors, Trials and Investigations. Not since Watergate have ongoing criminal trials and congressional investigations been such a potential factor in the presidential election. So as we begin this morning, I want to welcome the panelists. We also have a new panelist joining us, Cynthia Oxney, who is a legal analyst for MSNBC. Eugene Daniels, who many of you met uh, yesterday, if you joined us yesterday, who is a political correspondent and the White House correspondent for Politico, uh, and also um, is wearing my favorite color today. So I don't know. I, for you. I appreciate that. I appreciate that. I told him I might want to give him a big emerald ring to complete the outfit. I but will take it. I'll have to ask my wife. <laughs> ask my wife about that one. Um, and then Sarah Craig and Jared um, Agin are joining us, both deep uh, leaders and operatives in the Republican Party, um, who have had experiences in the White House, in Congress in campaigns, um, and so we're, we're going to have a robust discussion today um, and analyze uh, what some of this context might mean. So I'm going to start on the far end of the table with Cynthia. Um, help us understand what is the lay of the land for former President Trump in terms of what is happening or on the table legally. Okay. Well, there are, uh, there's a lot on the table. <laughs> As you know, there are four basic cases, <clears throat> and I, I think I'll take them by threat uh, to the election, then you guys can decide what you think about it. Uh, there is the documents case at Mar-a-Lago. That case is set for trial in May. It will not go in May. It's being slowly, the can is being pushed down the road. I don't think that'll go anytime soon, so we'll wait and see what happens with that one. That judge seems to have a preference. I'm happy for her. She's exercising her power, and we're not going to see that case anytime soon. The next case is the um, civil fraud case in New York. He's in the middle of a trial with Judge Ngoran. Judge Ngoran has basically already decided there's persistent fraud and is looking about seriously removing his business uh, and taking away all his money. Uh, that case continues. It's going very well for the prosecution. It will go another two months, and then there will be appeals. It's going to go on for a while, but it is a financial threat, um, which may or may not end up being a political threat. That's up to them, but it, it is a financial threat to Trump. And then the two cases that are most in the news are the Georgia indictment, uh, the RICO case, and the January 6th case uh, by Jack Smith. The January 6th case by Jack Smith is set for trial in March, basically on Super Tuesday. Um, it may or may not go then. There's a real possibility that will, will not because the Trump people have filed a motion on absolute immunity saying he's absolutely immune from a criminal prosecution because he was president. They have a civil case to support that, not a criminal. Um, and Jack Smith has responded and said, forget it, that's a civil case, uh, and the judge has to make a decision on absolute immunity. What's different about that motion compared to everything else from a legal point of view is that is immediately appealable before the trial, and it will be appealed. So it's a big question mark on whether or not that appeal works through the system in time for them to be a trial, so probably not in March, but could be shortly thereafter, or if the Supreme Court takes it, it could take a long time. We just don't know. If that case doesn't go to trial in March, it opens up the window for the Georgia case to be tried. Because as you know, the Georgia case is a big RICO case. Originally, oh, it's the Racketeering and Influenced Organizations Act. Um, it has to do with whether or not there was an, an organization, an enterprise that committed X amount of felonies. It's a very liberal um, statute in Georgia, and it all has to do with the fake electors plot, the uh, testifying to the Georgia House of Representatives by lying, uh, pressuring Raffensperger and other members, and attacking the voting um, in Coffee County. So that case is kind of up in the air because there's so many plea deals, and that judge has a big open space in his docket now. So if the 
if the January 6th case doesn't go, it can go. And those of you who are following the news know that in that case, pleas are falling like dominoes. Three of the five lawyers have already pled. Uh, my guess would be the one of the remaining lawyers will plead in the next week. Um, and the, the fake electors have either pled or, in my opinion, are about to plead. And we have the crazy Kanye West person. That person will plead. And we'll end up with a trial, ready for trial, of Trump, Giuliani, Clark, and maybe Meadows. So that case is set for trial. That's kind of the stage. We can talk about other things that are happening, because a lot of interesting things are happening about the plea now or later. I think we'll save that, because we're going to go to Eugene and round out all the, the different legal pieces, the congressional investigations yeah. that are occurring, and then we have some added action in the Senate of late. Yeah. Um, consistent in... When, <clears throat> when Republicans took over, even before they took over uh, the House, they were saying they were going to immediately start investigating the Biden administration. Um, they were ready for that. They were kind of <laughs> thrilled to do so. Um, on day one, even before, as soon as Biden was elected, um, Marjorie Taylor Greene, who you've probably heard of at least once or twice, um, filed articles of impeachment of Joe Biden. He hadn't really done anything yet, <laughs> but um, that had started. So we're seeing that continue to roll out. There's an impeachment inquiry into Biden. Um, when you talk to even Republicans um, behind closed doors, you know, on background, not on, not on the record, uh, they will tell you they've been disappointed in kind of how this has rolled out, um, that they are focusing on things that don't matter, that won't break through with voters, or even um, hold in, in any kind of interview, um, for example. So there's an impeachment inquiry of Biden. Biden also has his own special counsel um, who's investigating his documents case. All these guys are taking their documents home um, <laughs> when they leave the White House, and they should really stop. Um, <laughs> right? Yep. Cynthia, see? Some just the lawyers create their own server. Exactly. <laughs> Everyone leave their documents and servers at home. Um, and you're going to get to the server. Uh, and... Um, the, he just recently sat down with the special counsel's team at the White House over two days um, during it, uh, earlier this month. Um, the thing that is, I guess, good for Biden when it comes to the special counsel investigation is that he hasn't been fighting it. His team from the very beginning has handed over documents. They were the ones that let the archives know that they found documents at his office that he was using between the vice presidency and him running for president. Um, they found documents at his home, also told um, the archives and, and the proper authorities. Uh, they, had, they were at his homes in Delaware, um, and from the very beginning, the White House was trying as much as they can to give him as much access. So it seems like, just like Mike Pence, who also had a documents um, case, uh, he will kind of it will kind of end without any um, criminal, uh, any charges or anything like that in that case. Um, and his son, Joe Biden's son, um, has his own special counsel and being investigated for kind of a flurry of crimes um, that have happened over the years, both taxes um, and also his having guns. One thing that's very interesting that people like me um, that are obsessed with politics are watching is it seems like his lawyers might... Um, talk about how important the Second Amendment is in expanding gun rights, while his father, at the same time, um, is working on the other side of, of that issue. And that will be really fascinating to watch as, um, as that moves through the court case. Um, Republicans have tried to tie Joe Biden and Hunter Biden together. Like, you know, Hunter Biden was doing this messy and possibly illegal stuff here. Um, and so Joe Biden had to know he had to be involved. Um, there's not been any kind of hard evidence at this point that they've shown that Joe Biden had any involvement in his son's um, business dealing foreign or otherwise. Uh, and also, <laughs> there is um, in the Senate, um, Bob Menendez, who is a New Jersey uh, senator, longtime New Jer Jersey senator, has been indicted um, for <laughs> he, <laughs> a flurry of... of um, Basically, um, on, under FARA, which is the Foreign Agent Act, and that is one thing that is, I think a lot of senators are wanting him to retire. We're seeing um, both 
um, John Fetterman of Pennsylvania, Cory Booker in New Jersey being very outward about he needs to go. This is a distraction. You need to handle your indictment and your investigation um, and get out of the Senate and do so. This is not the first time that he has been mm -hmm. um, charged with something similar to this. Uh, so that is another one, I think, that is most of the investigations. Uh, <laughs> the, Biden, the Biden administration is also being investigated by Congress, um, basically every single um, department of, you know, insert department here is being investigated by the House Republicans, especially um, Alejandro Mayorkas, who's the department, who's at the head of the Department of Homeland Security and handles a lot of the immigration aspects of the Biden administration. When you're the moderator, you get to make other people go through all of the information. <laughs> yeah. So I, I thank both of you for, for teeing this off. The place I want to start is, is first, how historic is this moment? How unique is this moment with all of this that you've laid out? And then we'll dive into the election pieces. I'm going to start with you, Jared. Oh, yeah. I mean, we're... Uh, we passed normal five train stations ago. I mean, we are... We are, we are uh, <laughs> We are through the looking glass, and um, I, I mean, just looking, I mean, that took 10 minutes just to lay out. The, 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 <laughs> and there's more, we, but we right. had to stop um, at some point. No, I, I think we're, so I'll get a little to the politics part, but um, we're so far beyond. I mean, I, I, you know, there wasn't just, you know, Trump's not just been indicted once, he's been indicted four times, you know what I mean? We, we didn't just have, um, Federal cases, you've you've now got state and and local um, prosecutors going after Trump. Um, beyond that, we didn't touch on this, but it's relevant. Like, we didn't just have a speaker get overthrown; we had a speaker get overthrown, and now we're weeks later, and we're on number four or five of who might be it. So, so like, the the point I'm trying to get across is th the new normal is this. It's not. It's it's. I don't think we're ever going back to what it used to be. And I think the reason for that is because the the, the bouncing ball that, you know, the, the, the normal power centers who could control the bouncing ball in the past, the speaker, you know, the president, th that's that's not the case anymore. The bouncing ball is now moved by the Matt Gateses of the world. And if they move the bouncing ball, the narrative shifts. And the reason that's important, if I can just, you know, from my kind of Republican perspective is Trump himself, it, he views optics, somebody said it yesterday, optics is everything. Everything is a television show. We are living in, you know, we're about to be, you know, season whatever of the Trump show, <laughs> and it's going to be the courtroom season. Do you know what I mean? It's, this is the trial season. And so we're setting the stage for that. And, and all of it is very much, and, and uh, people don't always believe this, but like, it's hour by hour how do I change the cable news dialogue? Mm. Uh, and and how, do I, how do I affect what Eugene's gonna write the next morning? And, and that mm. is, um, that's when you see all, all of this that we've laid out. I, 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 I think that, that the Trump team sees it and they say, okay, I am going to, here's how I want next season, the courtroom season to play out. Mm -hmm. And um, so yeah, this is, you know, we're, we're in for that and um, everything they laid out, it, you know, who knows what, we don't know which characters are gonna come in and, and, and I do think, um, you know, there has to be an A plot and in Trump world, the A plot is everything he's doing and there has to be a subplot and the subplot is what's happening um, uh, on the, you know, impeachment inquiry right now. I think Jared's accepting calls from Hollywood writers now, if anybody <laughs> wants, he's, he's got this laid out. Um, and I think, you know, we've experienced an example of what you're saying where Trump left court and said, I don't even know, I hardly know Jenna Ellis, who's that, right? <laughs> Sidney Powell, kind of the same deal, trying to control the, the immediate narrative. I, I should say the one caveat is, I am, I am not a lawyer. Uh, I am happy to give free free legal advice here today. Yeah. Um, but uh, if any, I'm uh, I'm a comms person pretending to be a lawyer. If there's any people who want to start a bipartisan firm of former comms people who think they're legal analysts, now is the time to do it. So I'm, 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 I'm accepting offers. Right, Sarah, let's go to you. So much to unpack here. Yeah. Um, I will just start by saying that is um, more I've learned about the Trump investigation that I've known the entire time because it is just so much constant information all the time 
you know, I live and breathe this business. This is what I do for a living. And I could not have told you that there were four different cases. I thought there were maybe three. There's I, actually I, a fifth one. And I, I mean, that, that, yeah. <laughs> that's, I mean, the point is, you know, sorry to all my media friends, but I'm not watching the Sunday shows. Like, I've got a six-year-old and an eight-year-old. We're watching Bluey on Sunday morning. It is not, like, this is not what Americans live and breathe. And so at some point, this all becomes background noise, and that's the question is how much does this really matter and how much is it going to matter? I would be as surprised if six months from now Trump is indicted. I would be as surprised if Trump six months from now was cleared of every case, and I would be just as surprised if six months from now nothing has happened and we're still sitting in this limbo that we've been in. So no one knows what's going to be uh, around the corner a year from now. Mm -hmm. um, so it's really hard to make, make election predictions, but I will say, you know, from the Republican side, there is this sense that there's two tiers of, of justice in the country, and that's just what you hear from Republicans constantly. I don't have to get into all of the back and forth on it. You can turn on Fox News for five minutes and get a, get a sense for it. You know, I made the joke earlier about Hillary's server that was never investigated. You know, it took us taking back Congress to even look at Hunter Biden's laptop. We were told before the election that it wasn't real and it was not something that, that we needed to focus on. Um, you know, uh, Russia collusion, all of that at the the beginning of the election when Trump was first um, elected in 2016. And so there is this sense from Republicans that that they're going to go after Trump regardless of what he did, regardless of what he didn't do, and it's they're just going to go after him. And right, wrong, or indifferent, that's kind of where the psyche of, of a lot of Republicans are. Um, and then when you're in the middle and you're not paying attention to this stuff day in and day out, it, it just becomes noise. And so I don't know. I mean, I don't think anyone, there's a, there's a panel coming up of like what to expect in the next few months. Good luck, because I, like he said, we are way past normal. I have no idea what this is all going to look like a year from now when, we're, when voters are actually going to the ballot to, to vote in 2024. Yep. It was Whoopi Goldberg who said normal's only a setting on the washing machine. <laughs> so, but, but perhaps we're much further than she was thinking yeah, even at that know. time. But Eugene or Cynthia, do you have things to add in terms of the historic moment we're in or unique moment we're in? Yeah, I think something that has been really fascinating fascinating to watch is, as Republicans say, there's a two tier, um, two tiers of justice. That is something Democrats have been saying for a long time, <laughs> right, for different reasons. Um, and I, I was talking to someone last week, a, a Democrat, who was like, tell the Republicans we would happily have them come over and try to fix the criminal justice system <laughs> <laughs> from, the, from the ground up um, if they have the complaints that they have. I think something that, Jared, you said um, sparked kind of a reminder in me when we keep, as the speaker race has been going on, is that Donald Trump's name popped up. He put his own name in that. And if you have been following Donald Trump and you watch him, when things are going bad in one place, he tries to distract it with something else. So he tossed himself into the speaker's race, um, largely to distract from the fact that all of these cases that Cynthia laid out are happening, that the Georgia case seems to be going much quicker, I think, than a lot of people anticipated as you know, people are, are dropping like flies um, with these plea deals. And the idea that there is the Trump show and this season is a court case, all of the other stuff is going to, he's going to be throwing things out there. And we as, you know, reporters um, often have to be very careful of chasing um, the things that he says. There was one, at one time in one of these cases, he said, I'm going to be indicted and arrested on Monday. Monday passed, Tuesday passed, Wednesday passed, and we spent days and days talking about it. And what that did was give him carte blanche on both in, in playbook and articles, in um, on basically every channel, um, every late night show, every everything, giving more Republicans who believe that believe Donald Trump is being persecuted um, more fodder for that. And I think that's something that as all of this is happening, that's usually how I think about it is. Mm -hmm. Like, there's so many distractions and you have to be careful because it's not that it doesn't matter, it's that it's not breaking through. And um, we haven't been in a position like this in this mm -hmm. country. And I think both operatives and reporters mm -hmm. have to be very careful and, and take it very seriously and think about the the gravity with which it's gonna happen and trying to, you know, take the crystal ball and say, you know, in, in a month, he's that's it. You know what I mean? There's just an analysis and kind of guesswork, which is how twenty sixteen we on this twenty sixteen was a lot of guesswork. Um, I think we've learned a few lessons. Mm -hmm. 
um, or Donald Trump has taught us a few lessons as we've moved forward, but it's clear that we we still have a few more to go. And I think that that's largely how I think about kind of all the Trump things, because as Sarah said, it's so much to go through sure. as a reporter. Most reporters are not lawyers. Thank God we'd be extra annoying if we were both lawyers and reporters. Because <laughs> um, we're already annoying as journalists by ourselves. Um, and Present company pres- is obviously, excluded. I would analysts, never. Right. I'm terrified of <laughs> Cynthia. Um, <laughs> um and so you kind of have to, like, you know, be very careful when, as these things are, are kind of yeah. going on. Cynthia? Well, I, I mean, I don't have a political perspective, but from the prosecutor, from the career prosecutor perspective, I agree there are two tiers of justice in a million ways. Uh, interestingly for Trump, he benefits from that. I got news for you. If your average black kid who was in a gang published, if you come after me, I'm coming after you, the prosecutors deranged, the witnesses, this witness, that witness, this witness, this is their address, this docs, their ass would be in jail. And nothing to Trump, and it goes on and on. So from a professional lawyer's view, he benefits with all this hoo-ha. And mm-hmm. any normal defendant, the federal judge would have put in jail by now. Mm-hmm. And he would stay in jail until trial. And I think he gets the benefit all the time of his celebrity and his money and his power. And it's offensive to many of us, particularly me. (laughs) Just to be clear. (laughs) I love that. So let's, let's dive a little further into the election. What are the implications for the presidential primary season for the general election? And let's just grab the down ballot piece while we're at it. I'll start with you, Sarah. Okay, so um, I don't, obviously I'm gonna caveat this with, I do not know what's gonna happen six months from now. Um, You know, we didn't, I don't think any of us anticipated being here today six months ago. So um, take everything I'm saying with a grain of salt. But I always go back to, when it comes to elections, um, Ronald Reagan in 1980, when he was closing out the campaign against Jimmy Carter said, um, what are you, are you better off today than you were four years ago. And that's kind of the principle that we always in, in campaigns and elections use at, at this juncture. And I would argue for a lot of Americans that no, they are not better off today than they were when Biden took office. Um, I read a stat the other day that if you were to buy today a $400,000 house with 20% down, it would cost $1,000 per month more than it did two years ago, and that's because of the high interest rates. It's an 8% interest rate right now if you want to buy a house. You know, my brother totaled a car a couple of weeks ago or a month ago, and he had to buy a new car. He can't afford to just buy one with cash, so he has to take out a loan. It is a 6% car loan. Like, that's outrageous. We haven't seen those kind of rates in a very long time. Um, You look at the chaos on the world stage. Inflation is through the roof. Car pr- or gas prices, and, and you know we know that there's a lot of reasons why gas prices are as high as they are. They were not this high when Trump was president. And so I think all of that is going to matter to the everyday voter more than these trials, more than some of this, this other stuff that at some point just becomes noise because you can't focus on all of it. And so how is their daily life impacted by what is happening on the, on, in, in presidential politics? That's what people are gonna go to the polls for both up up ballot down ballot everywhere there's also um, you know we could have don't don't fool yourselves into thinking that Biden's going to be an incredibly popular Democrat candidate either there's a lot of people who don't want Biden to be the the nominee on the Democrat side and so I think if you see a Trump Biden reelect we could be looking at very low depressed turnout in a way that we haven't in the past and so there's a lot of factors that are going to go into um, what happens a year from now. Um, but I think the personal side of it and how people feel on a daily basis is going to matter more than some of the noise that we're talking about today. Jared? Yeah, I think there's um, th- there's a narrative argument, which I touched on a little bit, that it affects, but there's some practical pieces to it. Um, the narrative one I mentioned, and it, it this is the stuff none of us know, uh, t- Trump will obviously use any small victory, no matter how small, to 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 drive momentum, drive the narrative. And the flip side of that is if things go bad, then the narrative goes the other way. So the, that influences kind of the national coverage and dialogue. The, the tactical um, part is, you know, with trials, with 
anything, you know, this could throw debates totally out the window. We could not have a, a general election debate um, given what's going on in the legal. It, it obviously it will affect f fundraising and schedules. And so there's a lot of these things that, that tactically campaigns spend a lot of time on and think about and do that again, are all you know, completely up in the air right now. And, and so those are some of the things that I think are a little under the surface that we don't always talk about, but those two will be heavily affected by what's mm -hmm. happening. Out Eugene? You know, one of the, I think one of the things that's really fascinating is that for President Biden, and really any president, there are a lot of things that happen that you kind of have no, like that you have no hand in. And, and I think largely Americans um, from no fault of their own, kind of misunderstand the presidency and often think you basically is like, he is the king. You know what I mean? He's the guy. If something's happening, it's on him. So this White House, every single White House that everyone here, whoop, everyone here has worked on and, and worked at, um, there's always a frustration that they get blamed for things that really, you know, they don't, there's not much they can do about it. Like gas prices, for example. As that was happening, you know, when gas prices were low, Donald Trump, didn't, he, do, he doesn't handle the gas prices a lot, right? It's not something that Donald Trump was able to do. Oh, we're not members of OPEC, which, you know, kind of deals with oil prices and gas prices. Um, and Joe Biden didn't either. And so that's something that's been really frustrating for this White House. Um, inflation, right? There's, there's still a lot of debate in, with, with economists on why inflation is where it is. Um, the question about spending during the pandemic and right at the beginning of the Biden administration, um, the and, and also during the Trump administration, was it the tax breaks? Like, why, why are, where's our economy where it is? At the end of the day, the economy is confusing for people. And I think that's something that uh, this the White House at times <laughs> kind of fails to, if not understand, at least let people know that they understand that, that there are all these conflicting things that are happening, right? Unemployment is down, right? People are, uh, there's so many jobs available. We're adding hundreds of thousands of jobs every single month, right? That is, in, in, in the old days, in the days of normal, um, that would be something that any White House would want, right? And that would say, our economy is humming along, we're going. But then you have inflation, and you most importantly have this kind of feeling um, amongst Americans that something's off, right? We just went through, and I think we don't talk about it enough, this once in a century pandemic where we were stuck in our homes, we were terrified of dying, millions around the world died. Our friends got, my grandmother got it when there was no vaccine, was in the hospital for two weeks, went home for a week, was in the hospital again for a week and a half. So we've all been through this kind of collective trauma, but instead of it bringing this country together as it used to, not this country, this, you guys have your own issues, but our <laughs> the United States <laughs> together, the United States together, um, it's pulled us apart and, and created these factions both within, um, within each party and also toward each other. And I think um, that is going to be at the center of how 2024 shakes out. Mm -hmm. Policy matters, right? I think everyone in here hopes that policy wins out at the end of the day, but I think it's the feelings that people have of mm -hmm. something's wrong, my family can't do this, mm -hmm. I want to do this. The feelings of people you know, who are scared of, an, of another Donald Trump presidency, there are millions of those kinds of folks who are worried that what he would do if he were to get in. If he were to win, you know, as a reporter, I, you know, we, when we talk to the folks that are around Donald Trump, the people that he would hire would look a lot different than the folks here that worked in the Trump administration at the time. I mean, maybe you guys would get jobs, but I assume it'd be you know, people who are more, more sycophantic. Um, and, and, you know, more in line with the, the Rudy Giuliani's, the Jenna Ellis's, the Sidney Powell's, the people that are probably <laughs> going to be um, at least uh, pleading out. Um, I think that is this, we don't talk about that enough when, when we think about the election. And the White House has been really bad and they have copped to this of selling their kind of story. And now they're, you know, walking around and talking about Bidenomics, but it's not easily explainable, right? When you, when you, you know, I see people get like shaking and um, concerned. Um, he doesn't even seem to like it. Like every time that he says it, he's like, you guys made that up. And it's like, okay, well, leave us out of this. You, have, you guys have owned it. Like that is a part of the conversation, but it's not easily explainable. It doesn't tell people much of anything. Mm -hmm. um, and so I know that they are still trying to figure out the, that aspect of the campaign. Um, and whether or not the Trump 
legal stuff breaks through, it will be a part of the narrative going into the, the general mm -hmm. if he is the nominee. Mm -hmm. One thing to add on to something Eugene just said, you know, in 2020, one of the big things that Biden told everyone um, and all of the Democrats said to, to the American people is let's put the adults back in charge and like this is going to be normal again and, and we're going to see um, America back in the place that, that, that it should be. And I, to the feeling that Eugene is talking about, that the American people don't, still don't feel that. And I think that's going to be one of the hardest things for Biden going into 2024 is that there's still this sense that, you know, there's chaos around the world. There's, you know, we're being told that Bidenomics is that everything's okay. Well, when I'm going to the grocery store, I've never seen eggs as, as expensive as they are. I've never seen milk as expensive as it is. And so that, that like adults back in, the, back in charge is not, it, it just isn't there that, that we thought it would be. And, the, and that feeling also is on both sides for different reasons. And that's why the question of is the country going on the right track um, is always a, you know, it's always a crapshoot because Democrats can feel like it's not going on the right track because we're continuing to see a lack of fo focus on climate change. We are watching and people feel like there's not enough criminal justice reform that in, in this country, that voting rights are under attack. You know, all of these different reasons why, reasons why Democrats feel the country is going on the wrong in the wrong way. The Republicans also feel that way because largely because Democrats are in charge, right? That Biden is in the White House. They feel uh, they have all their their litany of reasons that Sarah kind of went through a little bit earlier about why they feel like the country's on the wrong track. And so it just leaves you with an electorate that's volatile. Yep. And for the folks that are paid to figure out what to do with that volatility and get people to the polls for the different candidates. I don't know if there's ever been a tougher time mm -hmm. to kind of figure out, one, explain, right, what's mm -hmm. going on and why you should head to the polls and why it's important, but also um, to actually get them there and and make sure that that happens, make sure they have the access to the ballot in, in, in different states for different reasons. Um, it's a tough time in America. Yeah. Is the yep. Cynthia? Well, I just want to add one legal thing. I'm staying out of the politics, but one legal thing that's going to happen is if the... Georgia case goes, that will be televised. Yeah. So what Americans are used um, to, okay, there's the trial going on in New York when it looks like there's something big going on, Trump goes, and then the coverage is all, Trump was here, look what he's gonna go after Cohen, or you know, there's all this drama, and he can create this drama and be in charge of what MSNBC says. Um, but Georgia will be different, and I don't know what the effect will be, but Georgia will be camera in the courtroom, mm -hmm. camera on, Jenna Ellis's face, mm. camera on uh, uh, Sydney Powell. Sydney, well, I don't know if Sydney Powell, who I think is totally crazy, is going to make the. I mean, I there's one there's one thing about a, a cooperating witness. You know, if you have a cooperating witness who's a murderer or a KKK guy or wherever else they are, they have authenticity in themselves about what they do, right? But Sydney Powell is just crazy. So I, I just don't know if you put her on the stand. That's another. Uh, that's a that's a legal discussion of, over a scotch. But, but <laughs> I will be buying you a scotch tonight because I want to hear that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but uh, I do think it's different, and I'd be interested to what you guys think. But that's what's coming down the pike if the Georgia case goes first. Those witnesses are live uh -huh. 24 hours a day. That's what we'll watch on yeah. television. Yeah, I, I would say that some of the panels talked on this yesterday, and good pollsters here who can speak better than me, but I mean, it. it it's going to come down to a small number of states, and it's going to come down to mm -hmm. independence in a small number of states. And so while I think people like us on this panel, maybe not Sarah, but we'll be glued <laughs> to watching uh, <laughs> what's happening, um, uh, you know, way better. Uh, uh, <laughs> by their nature, these the, these independent voters probably will not be watching. And so it, it, could, it very much could be different issues state by state, you know, that is really what's driving them versus, you know, the us who kind of soak all that in, who are going to be, you know, glued to it every second. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, the question of if the televised makes it different is more about how the ecosystem that people are in treats it. If Fox News um, and One America News and, and, and kind of the right wing apparatus ignores the Georgia case, then... Um, you know, Republic, a lot of Republicans won't see it. A lot of folks that mm -hmm. do watch Fox News like at night won't mm -hmm. see that stuff. I would assume that at least the news shows, the shows that consider themselves news that aren't in the kind of like the primetime opinion space will have aspects of it. I don't know that they're gonna do it all day. 
as someone at MSNBC, I assume, Michael and Cynthia, that it will be on quite a bit on, on <laughs> just a little bit. Um, maybe live streamed is the word. <laughs> all Georgia all the time. We might have to move there. Um, and so it, so it'll be about the ecosystems that people live in and whether or not it actually matters. It will, whether or not the Biden administration and more importantly, the down ballot folks um, take an opportunity to like, tie those candidates to what's happening. And I think largely Democrats don't use, the Democrats are big nerds. And so they often, you know, spend a lot of time talking about numbers and, <laughs> you know, they talk about numbers and there's lots of charts. I think you guys will cop to that. Um, and what they've gotten better at is kind of being, having a more simple message. And when you have all of this happening, Georgia's happening, mm -hmm. it took them, you know, the speaker fight took forever. Mm -hmm. We may not have a speaker. I don't know, you know, we have Mike Johnson, who's the speaker designate now. There was another one a couple of days ago, right? Like, so it's like, who knows if how that shakes out. Um, but at the end of the day, what Democrats are trying to do is say, there's just chaos over there, right? Like, it's chaotic. And it is. So it happens. It's not only just a spin. It's actually true. There's all this evidence that the American people can look at and say, okay, well, the head guy is in court literally all the time. He... Um, only talks about himself, which is something that Republicans are, you know, mm -hmm. when he gets in front of the cameras, they're like, you know, talk about, you know, how much Biden sucks. And he's like, I'm going, you guys, I'm going to go to jail because of, they hate you, right? And so that does not exactly, mm -hmm. um, this is not exactly what his team often wants him to do. Um, and so that aspect of it will, will, I think, change a lot of, could change a lot of hearts and minds if Democrats do it the right way, right? Like it's all about turn out, turn out, turn out, but it is, and convincing mm -hmm. people mm -hmm. um, that you have earned and deserve another four years, and more importantly, like keep the other guy out. Biden needs Trump to be the nominee, frankly. You know, other people may disagree. Um, I'm curious if the Democrats do. Um, but I think Biden needs Trump to be the nominee. It's a much easier race for him. They're both old. They're both old white guys. If he goes against Nikki Haley, um, Ron DeSantis, Tim Scott, Collins, I got you. Um, <laughs> um, or Tim Scott, you know, that is, that's just a harder race for him, right? Mm -hmm. and, and Democrats will cop to that. Um, and so I think, you know, the both of them kind of depend on each other, the two of them. I don't mm -hmm. know that, that Donald Trump could beat a lot of the Democrats that are kind of waiting in the wings either. Yeah. So I want to take this back to a higher plane before we, do we have time to take a couple questions from the audience? So coming out of yesterday, there were a couple of threads, and I'll let you all decide kind of which direction to take this. But one thread was, does this undermine all the things that have gone on, like the faith in different institutions, the ability of institutions. You just touched on this a little bit too, Jared. H how do we write the course if we're talking about our democracy, keeping it strong, et cetera? And another piece, and you, you get to pick which, which way you wanna go with this, is how would you talk to somebody who is, you know, the next generation of voters about their participation in this, like what what's the incentive for them? What's, you know, are, are they going to participate in something that will be robust in the future? So I'm gonna start down with Cynthia and bring it back this way. Well, I mean, I, I don't do the politics piece, right? But it's not, yep. that's not my lane. But I do think that the Trump years have dramatically injured the, the justice system. I think people, it not only happened because of Trump, but also because of the highlights of what, you know, the reality of George Floyd and, and everything that happened. All of this has happened at once. And um, for me, when I look at the justice system, I see that he has gotten away with this uh, for so long. And I think a lot of people feel that way, that if he was, if he were um, a, a, a black kid, he'd be in jail. Or a black business owner, or uh, almost anybody else, he would be in jail. And I think that hurts us. I mean, I, it also, the, the entire criminal justice system is paralyzed by him. I mean, we have this really strong federal judge uh, in DC, and nothing's happening, and he's threatening people. Uh, we can't seem to get a case to trial. Um, people were pardoned who committed crimes during his administration. Can't seem to do anything about that. So all kinds of things have happened, I think, that have 
undermine people's ability to think, you know, I can, I can trust the criminal justice system. <laughs> and that hurts us all. You know, it's not just the election system and mm -hmm. what's happened with, do we trust elections? I'll leave that to you guys. But also not to trust that, um, that the powerful don't just have all of the, all of the, the deals. They don't get away with everything. I mean, you know, when Menendez has gold bars in his house, like, what's that about? <laughs> you know, and, and everybody's like, oh, well, you know, it's Menendez. And I mean, there's, there's, I mean, there's some of that, right? Yeah. That's what's happened, mm -hmm. and it's it, it's insidious. And I don't know how we get it back to a sense that you know politicians don't have gold bars in their house, and politicians don't threaten other politicians, and people do have to pay their taxes. I don't know how we get that, and I have a real sense of hopelessness about it that is not solved by scotch. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> scotch might make it worse. All right. Um, I mean, the, the lack of trust in institutions is, I think, at the, the center of politics, period, right? Like, I think we don't talk about it a lot because it's kind of like up here and it's not as fun as the horse race or looking at poll numbers or, you know, talking about Biden's age or Trump's court cases. Um, and so I don't know how you would, how we would fix that. I think the, the only thing that the kinds of people who I know that work in the business, the folks that are here and have been coming to this for 15 years, is doing the work, right? Like as a reporter, I can only do the work and continue to try to live up to what my institution, what the fourth estate was set up to do and be, hold powerful people accountable, for your favor to no one party, no man or woman. Um, and I also want to take your last question about what would you say to someone, young people, because I've had this conversation with my um, younger cousins and my younger my siblings, um, is like, you know, why why should I care? And I, you know, there's the obvious reasons of I'm black and you're black and our grandmother um, and her and my our grandfathers all fought for this. Our grandfather was a Baptist preacher in South Carolina, right? So he was like at the forefront of civil rights in South Carolina. Um, this we tell the stories of like our grandmother's mother who would take a pail in the car. And because the bathrooms are so disgusting in South Carolina, my um, the six of my grandmother and, and her um, siblings would use the bathroom in a pail because of how disgusting the bathrooms are. And when you think about that and the kind of trials and tribulations the people that came before you went through, it should push you to want to make things better in the country. Um, and democracy only works if we say it does. That's the weird thing about democracy is that it only works if the folks that are, which we've seen over the last few years, right? You look at um, what happened after the 2020 election, and if one side, one candidate decides, nope, I'm not doing, I don't, I don't like the way this turned out, that means that democracy is in peril. And you've talked, you talked about that quite a bit yesterday. And so it will be robust. It will be a robust democracy if the next generation. Um, steps up and does it and engages. Political power is not the only kind of power and sometimes not even the most effective, currently right now, definitely not the most effective <laughs> kind of power you can wield. Um, but at the end of the day, it is a huge tool to move forward, both progress, the culture, um, it, it, the changes within culture, um, and making things better for the folks that are, that are coming behind us. Mm -hmm. Sir? So, um, I say this sitting next to a journalist, so <laughs> let's be careful here. But um, I think that the distrust in the media is one of the things that is most concerning on my side. And, and I don't think it's not earned. Um, I, I think there are certainly times when, um, you know, we were told that we couldn't even say the words Wuhan lab when COVID origins or, you know, that was banned from Facebook. Um, and it was taken off of Facebook, and you couldn't even say it, or you were, you know, I don't, shamed. Um, and, and it turns out, no, that probably is the case. And um, the Hunter Biden laptop, I talked about that earlier. I, I just think that there is, you look at the media, and, and for the most part, especially younger journalists, they tend to be um, liberal. And, and there, is, there is, in our side, a definite concern about media bias on the left. 
And so there becomes um, a huge mistrust in the media. And I'm, I think you're wonderful. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> you can trust um, um, <laughs> but, but it is. And Jonathan Martin. He's yes, awesome. yes. <laughs> but it is, a real, it is a real thing. <laughs> and, um, and so I, th I think that that becomes, then you, then you start to see people seek out their own media sources, which causes us as a society to live in our own bubbles. And Democrats do it too, because Democrats aren't watching Fox News, they're watching MSNBC. And you cannot tell me that MSNBC is not the exact same thing Fox News is, just on the left. And so people live in their own bubbles, they're able to follow what they want to follow on Twitter, they're able to follow what they want to follow on Facebook, and they're able to tune out the other side completely. I, I was telling some of you this earlier, I went to Israel back in June, and it was another bipartisan trip. And that's why I think these are so incredibly healthy because we all get to know each other and we know that we're all real humans even though we, we believe in our country, we just think of different paths to get there. Um, I went on this trip and we had a guy at the end of the trip stand up and say, you know, I really was nervous to come on this trip because this is the most amount of Republicans I've ever spent time with for the longest amount of time. And, and one of the Republicans goes, dude, there's five of us. <laughs> and we were only here for a week. Um, and so it causes us to kind of be in our own little circle, in our own little bubble, and then you don't trust anything else, that, that nothing can penetrate treat your own little bubble. And so that's the thing that concerns me the most about our country, um, is just the way social media has disrupted how we get news, um, and, and then the, the deep distrust that many Americans have in the media system. I've never seen every time you poll, like, who do you trust? The distrust in the media is the lowest, I mean, it's the highest it's ever been. Um, and so it just, it's, it's, that's the thing that probably concerns me the most. Yeah, I think, I mean, the, the problem I think right now is the incentives are, are off. Yeah. Um, mm. you, you go after Trump, you're gonna be famous. You throw out the speaker, you're gonna be famous. Mm. And I think, it's hard to see the path forward <laughs> sitting from here. However, the one thing I would say is, um, as tragic as they are, um, I, I think world events are the thing that can overcome that sometimes and put priorities back in check. I mean, we all checked our phones this morning and there was a new speaker a designate and we kind of rolled our eyes. And because the that story was big, prior to war breaking out in, in the Middle East. And I think rightly, everybody over the last couple of weeks has prioritized like, I, it is important who the speaker is, but I'm not really gonna waste my attention on that because there's bigger things happening in the world right now. Mm. And as, as horrible as that is sometimes, I, I do think it takes that to get us to, to get the incentives back in check. Mm. Um, time for one or two quick, qu two quick questions. I'm told. Okay, questions. Anybody at the back of the room? My dinner, my dinner partner, Baruch. Hi. Uh, thank you. Um, it was interesting and obviously disheartening to hear about the amount of crime, potential cr alleged crime, <laughs> alleged. Um, alleged. that's um, it, permeating the presidential election. Um, but I was curious that sort of what we didn't hear so much of, like is like, how much is this disqualifying of both or either candidates? And I think, certainly on the Republican side, perhaps I'm a naive Brit, but I, I wonder, like, there's a lot of talk of, oh, the economy's in a bad place, the media's biased, the criminal justice system might be biased, but do, how do we, how, how should we think of the fact that there is a solid chunk of the United States, the electorate, the Republican Party that is 100% behind um, Trump, despite the events of January the sixth, um, and the sort of the last, yeah, all of all of that, basically. You got this one. Uh, well, I would just say, I mean, uh, it, he's innocent until proven guilty, right? And I think um, that's why we talk about what will happen next year. Will happen next year, but mm -hmm. Donald Trump is innocent until proven, proven guilty. And I mean, whether or not it being disqualifying, that's up to the voters to decide, right? I think there is, our constitution um, doesn't seem to have anything that bars, um, even if he was, you know, became a felon to keep him from being president. You know, like he could be president from jail if he were in jail. Like there's just, there's just nothing that's ever kept 
um, someone from doing that. I think the founders probably thought it wouldn't happen. <laughs> I think they 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 did I don't not. No, they got in duels. They got they yeah the mean. duels were a little different because then yeah. the person was gone. You know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, let's not let's yeah. not make that where we end this thing. Okay. Yeah, don't leave with that. But I think you know the the question of it being disqualifying is is going to always be at the end of the day up to the voters like they will have their say we would do all of our writing they would do all of their knocking on doors and, and trying to convince people but at the end of the day how the voters feel is is the only thing that matters and if the voters decide that uh, joe biden deserves another chance he will get that if the the voters decide they're over joe biden they want to give the guy who had the job just before joe biden another chance and that they don't care what the media said or what the legal system says um then they will do that. And I think um, that's the thing that we often forget, mm -hmm. at least reporters do. OK, right up here. Um, how much do you think the order of the alliances has mattered? Um, obviously, some of the ones that came first were maybe less tangible, less easy for the public to understand. And do you think then, as an accumulative way, they kind of it became noise? Do you think that had an impact? Well, Cynthia. from a legal, I mean, there's a legal and a political to that, right? So the legal answer is it doesn't matter. The order, ultimately, the order will be decided uh, uh, by the judges. The the first one was the um, the paying off the porn star one, and that's just kind of disappeared, because that judge has said, "I defer. I realize this is not as important." So ultimately, the judges will decide, and then the hi that highlight will be what people see. The political impact I will leave to the rest of the panel. I mean, the the order of announcement, I guess the order of the indictments as they, as they were announced, um, I think has impacted making the noise. When the New York indictment happened, there were a lot of Democrats that were like, dude, not the Stormy Daniels thing again. Like, did it, we knew that there were all of these, you know, the special counsels for two different aspects of, of Trump's life, that um, there could be something happening in Georgia. Like, you could have, should have waited, because I think what it did is give Trump, um, the ability to say, see, they're trying to get me for something that I did before I was president. You know, so everything they do from here on out doesn't matter, whether that's actually true or not. Um, had the Georgia case gone first and you started seeing Sidney Powell and these other people flipping um, and, and the Trump folks getting a little nervous about that early on, maybe that's a different um, the calculation for Republican voters in the primary and that show up in polls. Same thing for the documents case, right? Like, that one is probably maybe easily explainable, I think, of, of the, the group of them. Um, had that gone first, that one's probably one that voters can be like, well, you weren't supposed to take that. You took it. They came to get it. You said no and tried to trade for things. So that was bad. Um, and so I think it will impact. And at the end of the day, Donald Trump is very good at like balling things up and saying, like, all of it's chaos. Throw everything at the wall. It doesn't matter. They're just trying to get me. And so that's why I think the, the order matters to like us, but I think the for um, and it would have mattered for, for voters in the Republican primary, but it doesn't matter to Donald Trump because he's gonna do the same thing no matter how the order popped out. Mm. I think it mattered. I think it helped the Trump team. Yeah. Uh, I think they we used the first one to to ship uh, ship the narrative or shape the narrative, I should say, and um, and they used that same model for the other ones. And you know, you even saw the coverage was fairly mixed on the first one. And so by the time you got to the next one, they already had their model down, and they just played the same game. Wrap it up. All right, gang. Thanks so much. This was this was very informative and appreciate all your thoughts. See, we made it through. <laughs>